this is lecture 38 So in the previous lecture, we were we we, uh, we dived into finding out the requirements of the loop chain to ensure that the closed loop system is stable. Not only stable, uh, it's well behaved, right? So so that if I if I give a step input, if I disturb it with a disturb uh, if I disturb the input with a step, the output doesn't go on ringing forever. Okay, the out, we, we saw the requirements for which the output can settle smoothly, right? And we then further saw that, in, we then further saw that if all the poles are uh, 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 all the poles are real, right? Uh, and then uh, we further saw that that the requirement was the poles should be far apart, right? In order to ensure that the phase margin is at least forty-five degree or above, right? For a second-order system, right? Uh, uh, so and uh, and we also further saw that. In order to ensure that in, to have a phase margin of 45 degree or above, right, we have to ensure that the UGB, the omega U of the loop can, right, fall fell under the, uh, fell in that part of the curve of the loop can where we had minus 20 dB per decade slope, right. So, uh, so essentially, we, what we uh, the the the, uh, the outcome of the previous lecture was. Ensure the poles of L of S are far apart. And second important outcome was ensure that around omega u the slope of L of S mod of L of S is minus 20 dB per decade so that the phase margin is greater than 45 degree right so these were the two uh, these were the two out two conclusions that we uh, that we ended up uh, Focusing on when we uh, uh, when we concluded the previous lecture, so so we will we what we'll do in this lecture is we will use this and uh, these two conclusions and we'll try to see what happens in a differential amplifier when I put the differential amplifier in a negative feedback loop, right? So in other words, what we are essentially saying is we have. Uh, we have our differential amplifier, a two-stage differential amplifier, and we have this is biased and all those things we know. Uh, Again, this is biased. I'm not showing the biasing network using current mirror for uh, for M0 and M6, let's say. It's M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. Uh, let's say this is V out. Now a quick quick refresher. So let's say I want to put it put this in a unity gain negative feedback configuration where should v not connect v not connect to the to the uh, gate of m1 or a gate of m2 so how do i know so let's assume v not is connected to the gate of m2 right so let's assume the v not is connected like this so let's go about and let's go around and see whether it's indeed in negative feedback so you can break the loop anywhere so let's say i break the loop here and apply disturbance here if the if the gate voltage of m5 goes up what's going to happen to v0 v0 is going to go down right v0 goes down this goes down which means if the gate of m2 goes down what's going to happen to the drain of m2 this guy will go up right 
So clearly this is a positive feedback loop. So V0 should not be connected to the gate of M2. Instead, V0 should be connected to gate of M1. And we should use M2 to apply our input, right? Vcm plus Vi. Right? So if everything works properly, incremental V0 will be equal to incremental Vi because ultimately this is this is similar to the case. This is essentially incrementally this is what this loop looks like where plus this is minus this is Vi. Right? If I am drawing, if I am talking about increment, I can as well uh, short the short the source because incrementally this is shorted and this is V naught, right? If the loop gain is high, V i will be equal to V naught because the input of the error amplifier will 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 go to zero. Okay, so this is something that we that we know that we have spent time before uh, uh, to to enhance our understanding. Okay, so now the question I am asking is. So now this is a negative feedback loop, whether the negative feedback loop is stable with adequate phase margin or not, right? So before to answer that question, what we first need to find out is, is what are the capacitances associated to this negative feedback loop, right? Then only we can answer that question, right? So what are the capacitances associated? So these are all MOSFETs, so all the capacitances are usual. So let's start off with uh, which node, let's start off with V01, this node. What all capacitances do you see here? So, firstly, the capacitance associated with M2 will be C, D, B of M2, right? So, there will be C, G, D of M2, correct? Uh, what about uh, Parasitic capacitance due to M4. So there will be capacitance of C D B of 4. Similarly, we'll have capacitance of C G D of 4. Right? What else? Uh, what about the what about the parasitic capacitance due to M3? Right, so there will be a capacitance here. There will be a capacitance between uh, C D B three. Then there will be uh, there will be C G S three, right? Because this node will have capacitance, right, of C G S three plus C G S four, right? Because both the uh, M3 and M4 are in parallel, their capacitances add up. What else? You have a capacitance here to ground that is CDB1. Then you have a capacitance CGD1. Right? Now what about the what about the output side? So the output side you'll have a capacitance here. CGD5. Right? Then you have capacitance of C uh, D B five, right? And maybe this is also driving a capacitive load, so you'll have a have a load resistance also associated with it, right? Uh, and there will be a capacitance here C G D six. Then you have a capacitance here C G D six, right? So this this structure might seem a bit intimidating. At a first sight, but you'll see that we can we can significantly simplify this structure for our uh, for our benefit. So let's let's do that. Right, so uh, right, 
So, so let's start off with the easier ones. So first let's assume that we we'll neglect the CGD, right? That's what we have been doing till now. So let's assume we neglect CGD. So, oh. so let's neglect CGD for now. We'll come back to CGD later, right? So, so let's like neglect the CGD capacitances. Okay, so let's keep this CGD capacitance for the for this for the moment, and I'll, I'll try and make a point. So, when we are doing a loop gain analysis, what are we doing? We are breaking the loop. We are applying a applying an input test input and finding out the return voltage, right? So, where should I break the loop? I broke the loop here. So, in the in this sense, where should I bro break the loop? I can break I can break the loop here, right? I can break the loop there and add a test voltage t test and observe the return voltage right so that's what we are going to do so we broke the loop right we shorted the incrementally shorted the input uh, apply a test voltage t-test right and we'll we are going to see what's uh, uh, what's our uh, what's our output because in this case v naught itself is v return right in this case v naught is equal to v return right so we are looking for minus loop gain is minus v return over okay fine so so if i if i concentrate on this on m2 and we saw that the cgd i mean the one of the inputs have got the input of m2 has gotten to ground which means that cgd capacitance is now grounded right which means it act comes in parallel to cdb cdb2 right so this uh, let's take one at a time so, so that things become slightly more palatable So, so the this capacitance is now grounded. So I can add it here, CGD two, and remove this capacitance here. Uh, the CDB M four, right? The CDB of M four, which was here, right? So, so that capacitance is also to incremental ground. So I can club it with our existing capacitance cdb4 right it gets clubbed into that existing capacitance uh, what about what about this cgd cgd4 right so in order to understand what's going to happen to cgd4 let's let's try to figure out what is the impedance looking in here what is the impedance looking into the gate of m3 note that i am looking into the gate of m3 where the m3 is diode connected right so what is the impedance the impedance is 1 over gm3 right now what is the impedance at what is the what is the impedance or what is the resistance looking into v01 what is the order of the impedance the order of the impedance looking into v01 is rds4 parallel rds2 right so similarly what is the order of the impedance looking into uh, uh, looking into uh, the output node again it is rds5 parallel rds6 right so you see that there are there are there are two high impedance two nodes where where the looking in impedance or the where 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 the where, uh, where the resistance the incremental resistances are of the order of rds right which essentially means that they are going to dominate the poles because Ultimately, what are poles? Poles are 1 over time constant If for first order systems, right? If we can break this up into first order systems, the poles are 1 over time constant. And lower the time constant means, or rather higher the time constant means, lower the poles, which means they are the ones that are going to dominate the transfer function. So we need not bother about 
to which at least we did not bother too much about high frequency poles which means a pole associated with 1 over gm right whose conductance is 1 over gm we can we can safely neglect right so it essentially means that the cgd4 we can assume to be also also grounded right because ultimately 1 over gm can be uh, so since 1 over gm is much much less than rds right assume cgd5 cgd4 is connected between p01 and ground right so so if that is the case we can add up cgd4 here also right okay and we will neglect uh, and also and also neglect poles associated or rather also neglect time constants associated with 1 over g right so essentially though even though even though we know some pole exists right they in fact uh, can affect our transfer function to make our life easy we will neglect that right so essentially we are neglecting the pole associated with with we, we are neglecting the poles associated with uh, uh, with uh, with the node pp3 okay so they 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 are gone okay fine uh, what else uh so another important thing is when we had when this guy was connected right when the loop was connected v naught was seeing v naught was seeing the cgs of m1 right v naught was seeing the cgs i mean cgs of m1 which means that if i have to find out if i have to ensure that the loop uh, the loop can actually deflect the behavior of a closed loop property i should ensure that even after breaking the loop v naught is loaded with v naught is loaded with the capacitance of m1 right so it, which essentially means that i should add cgs1 here right in principle i should add but the i will not add here because ultimately we know that this guy will be i'll be driving some capacitive load let's let me call it c2 right so i will be i'll be driving some capacitive load so essentially what i'm saying some capacitance c2 will be will be driving some capacitance c2 since we'll be driving some capacitance c2 and in general that order order of magnitude of c2 should be much higher than the internal capacitance of the op amp right in in general not always but in general so we can basically neglect whatever other capacitances that are associated with with the node right so we will just simply say that the total capacitance at this node is c2 okay okay fine what else so it seems like now seems like uh, after making all those approximations right after making uh, uh, also also we'll have a capacitance here cdb that cdb can be absorbed into c2 right uh, also we'll have a capacitance here cgd but cgd can also be observed into the into the capacitance c2 why because ultimately this guy comes from a ultimately i will be having some current mirror right ultimately i will be having some current mirror which means that the looking in impedance becomes 1 over gm which means that i can for practical purposes i can assume that input impedance is low so cgd can be grounded right so whole purpose of this making this approximation is to get rid of as many extra nodes as we can so that we can minimize our effort right without making too much of a too much of a error okay so essentially what ends up happening is this let's assume this is ideal current source because it doesn't affect our analysis here and we are applying v test here this is grounded again incrementally uh, 
and we have an effective capacitance sum clubbed into this effective capacitance and uh, we have this effective capacitance and we call this C1 and we have some effective capacitance we call this C2 correct so so in other words in a block diagrammatic form what do I see what do I see I see that I have a voltage control current source right whose output is loaded with some capacitance C1 and obviously it has some output R out 1 right and and this is the I have, here I have C2 and obviously there is some RO2, right? Okay. Uh, and what about the signs of the what about the signs of the uh, of the voltage control current source of this guy? So clearly, this this has to be positive. This is negative because we have to connect it like like this. The output goes to the positive terminal to make the loop. Overall negative feedback. So this guy goes to ground, and we will apply. We test here and this is our C return, right? And we'll have an overall GM for this, and this overall GM is GM1, right? GM of the transistor M1. Right? And what is R01? R01 is RDS4 parallel RDS2. Uh, right? What is R02? R02 is RDS5 parallel RDS6, right? So this is supposed to be M6, right? Okay. And C1 and C2, we, we, we spent some time understanding, right? The reason we are simplifying this is because we are we, we are comfortable, we are comfortable in dealing with circuits which are which which don't have like uh, 10 transistors at a time, right? So we are we, we are simplifying the entire analysis okay so let's let's analyze the block diagrammatic transfer function now and then see where where we end up right so okay so so what is the order of this system clearly the order of the system is 2 right clearly the order of the system is 2 we have two capacitors right we have two capacitors we can set and how many number of initial conditions that i can set on a capacitor so number the number of independent initial conditions In the net initial condition or sorry, initial voltage initial conditions that we can set in this case is two right we can set uh, we can set uh, two initial voltages on c1 and c2 independently of each other which essentially means that there are two differential equations two independent differential equations which means the order of the system is 2 right so that's what uh, that's what it means so the order of the system is 2 implies order equal to 2 implies we'll have two poles number of poles it will be poles is equal to 2 right so what is the pole location what is the first pole the pole associated with c1 let's say uh, c1 which is the pole associated with C1 will be 1 over time constant is 1 over C1 R01, right? What is the pole associated with, uh, or let me write in this form, let's say G01 by C1, right? So let's write in conductance domain, so this is G02, right? What is the other pole? C2 will be G02 over C2. Right? What is the DC gain? 
what is the dc gain of the loop the dc gain of the loop is gm1 by g01 times gm5 right gm5 by g05 so this is, let me call this g05 gm5 by g05 and negative right because ultimately when v test goes up this goes up this goes down right so it's negative of this okay so what is that what is our loop what is the l of s l of s is dc gain kdc by 1 plus s by p1 times 1 by plus s by p2 right this is exactly similar to that of the common source amplifier that we had initially done the analysis for and note that we are still neglecting cgd right because because since we are neglecting cgd this to these two sections these two sections can be can be analyzed independently of each other because there is no coupling between between the gate and the drain right so if if this is the case if this is the case if this is l of s what do i need to ensure uh, what do i need to do to ensure we have proper phase margin so if this is l of s so now uh, to ensure phase margin of the loop is greater than 45 degree we have to ensure p1 and p2 are far apart and omega u lies in between p1 and p2 right if that is not that, that is not going to happen then we are in trouble right so so now you choose you can choose uh, so choose your uh, choose which one you want to make it uh, which one you may uh, either p1 or p2 you can choose which one you want to make it a low frequency pole and which one you want to make it a high frequency pole right so essentially choose which pole we want to be low frequency right so if p1 is the low frequency pole then omega u will be what omega u will be so at omega u at omega u adc by s by p1 is 1 which means omega u will be adc times p1 right and similarly then you you you, uh, you choose the value of and you have to ensure that p2 is greater than omega u and depending upon how much phase margin you want you ensure that p2 is farther and farther away from from omega u right so in other words what we are saying is uh, your mod of l will be something like this this will be p1 you have to ensure that p2 falls here after the ugb right so that the angle the overall angle so the excess phase lag right this is the excess phase lag this theta this theta is this mod of theta is uh you don't want too much of lag phase, phase lag right so uh, you want this mod of theta to be let's say you want a uh, phase margin of 60 degree right so let's say for phase margin of let's say 60 degree this theta has to be minus 120 degree right for phase margin of let's say 76 degree this theta has to be how much 
minus 1 1 or minus 1 0 4 degree right and so on right so then you choose choose your p1 and p2 now the question is let's say uh, you you put this circuit together and you found that p1 and p2 are not separated by each that much right then what do you do then what you can do is you can if they are by default they are not separated you can choose any one of the you can choose any one of the uh, capacitance and make it dominant right so you can basically in this case you can add more capacitance physically you can add more capacitance to the node uh, to the node v not 1 right so in order to move p1 to a lower frequency now as you can as you can readily see right in order if you have to choose a capacitance uh, let's say if let's say initially your p1 and p2 were somewhere here let's say initially your p1 was here and p2 was there then your uh, your loop gain would have looked like the red plot, right? But we know that the phase margin of this red plot is quite bad, right? Because ultimately the UGB of the loop is, is at the location where we are hitting a minus 40 dB per decade slope, which means a phase, phase margin will be quite bad, right? So in order to in order to get a better phase margin, what are we sacrificing? We are sacrificing the bandwidth, right? We are moving the pole P1 to a lower frequency right this this pole moves to a lower frequency p1 correct so we are getting better phase margin but at the cost of at the cost of bandwidth now as you can see uh, you have the curve has a lower unity gain frequency which means your amplifier is going to behave like an amplifier right till a lower frequency than 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 before okay so that's one of the major bottlenecks of negative feedback right in order to in order to achieve stability we sacrifice speed okay okay so now let's let's uh, uh, let's go ahead and and uh, incorporate the cgd capacitance that we have been avoiding till now and it, this is a very interesting capacitance and it has a pro it has profound effects so so that's why let's we have kept the best for the for the last right so let's say so this is CGD, right? Uh, and this is GO2, GO5, right? We are doing calling it GO5. This is GO1. This is GM5. Okay. So let's see what is the effect, right? So ultimately, in this case, now what you can readily see that is V01 and V02 are coupled right in this case we cannot write a transfer function we cannot associate a conductance with a capacitance just by looking at the circuit because v01 and v02 are coupled through through a capacitor right so when we cannot really uh, cannot really uh, associate a time constant associated a time constant with the capacitance because it's a it's a large circuit, right? Uh, because uh, multiple capacitors are talking to each other. So, what is the next best solution? The next best solution is to do a brute force and find out the entire loop gain, right? So, essentially, solve for V return over V test using AVL and KCL, right? So if you do that, you are going to get this, right? So you will we are going to get L of S to be equal to. So I have done this beforehand. So so the derivation is not particularly important, but the important thing will be the uh, the interpretation of the result, right? So let me write out the result first, then we'll we will go ahead and interpret it. So L of S will be minus gm1 times gm5 minus SCGD right divided by S squared C1 C2 plus CGD C1 plus CGD C2 plus S times CM5 times CGD plus 
C1 plus CGD times G05 plus CGD plus C2 times G01 plus GDS1, GDS5, or rather G01, G05. Right? Seems like a very complicated expression, which indeed is. It's a big expression, second order term, and lot of terms here. Here, so the next thing will be to to make sense of these of these terms, right? So, so first thing, first thing, let's do the easier part. What is the DC gain? So, what is the DC gain? DC gain is you set all the s terms to zero, right? If you put s to zero, whatever you get is a DC gain, which will be minus gm1 gm5 by g01 g05 that is that is good that checks out how many poles will this have this is a second order system right how many poles are we going to have we are going to have two poles right and why does it make sense it makes sense because looking at the circuit i can set two independent initial condition between c1 and c2 right so essentially if i set If I set the voltage in C1 and if I set the voltage in C2, the voltage across CGD gets set, right? So I can set two independent initial conditions, which means that, uh, which means the order of the system is, right? Even though we have three capacitors, okay? So that that's good. Uh, so what so what about the poles? How should I go about finding out the poles? So so this seems to be an, I mean, the denominator of the transfer function is of this form, S square plus B S plus C, right? So we, poles are the roots of the denominator, right? So, so roots of the denominator means I have to find out the roots of, roots of S square plus B S plus C, right? So I can always do that quadratic formula of minus B plus minus B square minus 4 AC over 2 A. But as you can see, that algebra will soon be, become too messy, right? So we should not, we don't intend to go in that route. So the route that we want to take is as follows: that we ultimately want to design, we ultimately want to get a circuit that is that, that has a stable uh, transfer function, right? A stable loop gain, right? So which means that we want, to, or rather, we want, a, uh, we are in search of a circuit which has a stable closed loop response with a good tail margin. Which means that inherently we want a circuit in which the poles are separated, right? Which means the roots of the equations are separated. So, so as so as it turns out, there are ways of simplifying a quadratic solution if the roots of the uh, if the roots of the uh, polynomial is separated, right? And and what we are, we know that we know that in case of a quadratic equation, so if the roots are if p1 and p2 are roots then p1 plus p2 is minus b over a right and p1 times p2 is what it's c over a right this is the property of a quadratic that we all, you already know moreover now if p1 or let's say if p2 is a high frequency pole and if p2 is much much greater than p1 like mod of p2 or mod of p1 then then p1 is approximately minus b by a and p2 is approximately equal to minus c by right so then we see that there is some hope of of simplifying our expression right so in this case what is a So this is a what is c this is c and the middle term is e correct so let's let's put those terms back so so what is p1 in our case then so p1 will be minus b over a that is sorry uh,
sorry i made a mistake here right if p2 is much more than p1 then p2 is over equal to minus b over a and p1 is minus c over b right so what will be p1 p1 will be minus c over b right so so g not 1 g not 5 divided by that entire term right so if i do that and and we do a further one level simplification we we are going to get this we are going to get g not 1 divided by c times gm5 by g not 5 plus 1 plus c1 plus c2 g not 1 by g not 5 plus uh, this is CGD, not C, plus CGD, G not 1 by G not 2, right? So, this is uh, G not 5, right? Right? So, essentially, we are doing, we, we are simply doing this uh, minus C over B, but in C, I have G not 1 times G not 5, so I am dividing by G not 5, the numerator and denominator, and, and this is what we are, we are, we are going to get. Right. So now let's see whether this guy makes sense. Firstly, before going into figuring out whether this guy makes sense or not, so we what we like to figure out is there a dominant term in the denominator? Right. If there is a dominant term, then our life will be easier. I can neglect the other terms and try to make sense of it. Right. So what do you think? Do we have a dominant term? So we so moment if we have a GM somewhere, then you have to take notice. Right. We have a GM here. We have a GM5 by G05. What is this? What is what does this remind you of? So clearly GM5 by G05 is the intrinsic gain of the second stage. Correct? It's the intrinsic gain of the second stage. So second stage is a common source amplifier. You can assume that it's a gain of that common source amplifier. So clearly this is much greater than one. Right? So clearly this is much greater than one. And this is also greater than G01 by 5 and g not 1 by g not 5 right so so essentially it seems like we have a dominant term in the new denominator right since we and but i mean we can always assume that if cgd is much much smaller than everything then this is not dominant that's not the assumption what we are making we are essentially making that the assumption that we are making is uh, these are the capacitances are let's say of similar orders right if the capacitances are of similar orders So, if these uh, capacitances are of similar orders, then P1 can be approximated as minus G01 over CGD times GM5 by G05 plus 1 plus C1 plus bunch of terms which are which I can probably neglect right uh, right so so let's keep those terms for now and I, I'll try to try to uh, motivate you uh, we'll try to understand why the other terms make sense right so let's see why this these terms make sense so firstly uh, what does this this term remind you of? So this term seems to be it, it seems to be pointing to the fact that we have a CGD capacitance. Uh, the CGD capacitance has been amplified, right, by the gain of the second stage, right? It seems like uh, this seems like CGD has been amplified by the gain of the second stage right okay so now so now, which means that let's investigate what is happening right so seems like uh, seems like the second stage has a gain right so let's say if i if i only concentrate on the second stage we had a capacitance here it seems like if i this cgd right 
seems like this capacitance here is getting amplified for some reason right okay so we need to investigate that what about g01 what about the what about the numerator what do you th why, why do you think we have a numerator of g01 and what does it signify what does it point to so when i am saying our cap our our poles our poles are of the what form poles are generally of the form of some conductance by some capacitance correct so if the conductance is g01 which pole that uh, i mean uh, which node am i pointing towards so clearly it looks like i am pointing towards v01 right looks like because i have a i have a conductance g01 connected to it so the capacitances around g01 should contribute to that pole in the absence of ctd the capacitance attached to g01 was c1 but in the presence of ctd it looks like in the presence of ctd it looks like the capa the capacitance associated with g01 is c1 and an amplified version of ctd and bunch of other stuff right so let's concentrate on why are we having this amplified version of ctd right because what we are essentially say, saying saying that we have this c1 here we have g01 here right so it seems like the capacitance looking here is the amplified version of ctd right okay fine so let's let's investigate that for a moment so to investigate that i have to introduce another concept and the concept is that of miller effect right so 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 if we have let's say an voltage controlled voltage source an ideal amplifier of gain of minus a okay and i put a capacitor across it of value c right and i apply a test voltage p test what is the current that i will see if this is v test this guy will be minus a times v test so what will be the current through the capacitor the current through the capacitor will be 1 plus a times sc times v test right so so what is the impedance that i will see so impedance will be 1 by 1 plus a times sc which means that which means that which means that any contraption any capac if I, if i put a capacitor across a voltage control voltage source of gain of minus a then looking from the input side it seems like i am driving a capacitor of value 1 plus a times c correct so can you relate this with our uh, with our condition we can relate this because what is the gain of of this guy this gain of this guy is minus gm by g05 and and the and the voltage across the ctd is getting amplified by 1 plus gm5 by g05 which means that it it is seeming to our the g0 to g01 it seems like it not only has a capacitance c1 attached to it but it also has an amplified capacitance of ctd times 1 plus the gain of the second stage attached to it and that is what we see here right but note that this is not a voltage controlled voltage source this is a voltage control current source since this is a voltage control current source we cannot expect this miller capacitance to come as is and that is why we get some extra term right but fortunately these extra terms are not dominant right these are the extra terms fortunately these extra terms are not dominant i mean if you now say that c2 is very high then obviously they will become dominant then we will have to revisit but as long as c1 c2 cgd they are of similar orders then we can clearly see that c2 is not dominant uh, this extra terms are not dominant which means we can we can develop some rudimentary intuition as to what the pole locations are right what the pole locations associated with c1 is okay okay fine so that makes sense uh what about p2 right what about p2 so let's look into uh 
let's look into the intuition behind p2 or the location of the p2 